for ZDNet, I'm Dan Patterson, and today's interview is with Philip Rosedale. Now, his name might not be familiar, but I guarantee you know his work. Rosedale was the founder of early metaverse platform Second Life, and he's currently an advisor to a number of generative AI startups, including Midjourney. Now, there's almost nobody better in the world to help us understand this crucial inflection point that we're kind of living through right now and the limitations of artificial intelligence as well as the kind of wild potential. You want to stick around and watch this interview. Philip Rosedale is the founder of uh, Linden Labs, this is the company that built Second Life, one of the first persistent universes almost two decades ago. Uh, he's also an advisor to Midjourney, which is one of the contemporary and maybe transformative generative AI platforms. Uh, so, Philip, can you help us understand? Feels like there's a lot of hype, just what, like with metaverse and blockchain before it. Uh, Generative AI is is full of press headlines and and hyperbole, but uh, tell us where the the rubber meets the road here. I, is this technology truly transformative? I, I do think that it is in in a word, but it does remind me a lot of 1994 when my career started when the internet came online, the public internet. You know, like there was a tremendous amount of hype, obviously, about that. Um, it was merited in that all these amazing, you know good and bad changes happened to the world because of it. Um, but at the time, it was also super early. And, you know, the companies that succeeded in 94 are not the companies that we see now at all. Um, you know, Netscape is gone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, generative AI feels like the same thing. We're super early. Um, we've got a whole bunch of emerging categories where we're using AI, like uh, text completion and, you know, these large language models and then image generators like Midjourney. Um, and, and then, of course, there's many, many more things coming. You know, I think the high level observation is that we finally have enough compute to do something that rivals thinking, you know, that rivals human thinking. And that is turning over a lot of rocks in terms of opportunities. Um. What are some of those opportunities, uh, especially, you know, we hear about, well, AI may replace white collar jobs, uh, but what are some real examples of the opportunities that exist with generative AI? Well, I have to say, as somebody who's kind of watched people, um, pundits, you know, think out loud about this space for a couple decades now, I... I've said often lately that I think it's kind of ironic and funny that the white collar jobs will go first, not the blue collar ones. I think there's a certain greatness to that that makes me laugh. But um, I do think that there are elements of work that will be automated by AI. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's also fair to say that the impacts and the ways this affects us are going to be diverse and different rates and different impacts. It's not as if, you know, the alien AIs are going to land and get out of their spaceship and tell us all we can just go play on the beach and, you know, we'll be taken care of. Um, but I, but I do think that things like copywriting and some types of image generation and things like that are definitely, um, being profoundly changed even right now as we speak, you know, I, I see different applications every day. Actually, I think writing software, um, which I've been doing with GPT-4 and we've been doing experimentally at our lab here for some time. Uh, the ability of things like GPT-4 to write software code as, as an engineer uh, who still writes code myself, I, I would say is shockingly good. Um, you know, last night I asked GPT-4 to write something that simulated what's called the three body problem, which is, you know, three <laughs> objects that are orbiting each other, not the science fiction book. It could probably take a crack at that too, but uh, it actually wrote some software code that showed me, you know, three little planets going around each other. Um, that's just fantastic that it was able to do that in, I think about 90 seconds, something that would have taken me, an experienced person who's written that code before, would have taken me, you know, a couple hours to like rewrite it in a new language. So I think that kind of time compression and the ability to um, save yourself effort in many types of programming tasks is amazing. And it's totally here and it's here to stay. You know, there's, there's no question, but that that's going to have a big impact. 
as someone who writes words for a living, I've been pretty impressed by the leap from GPT 3.5 to 4. Uh, not just the speed, but the um, capabilities seem to be uh, significantly enhanced. So on that topic, Philip, I, we hear a lot also about the dangers of generative AI or potential dangers. You know, it could write ransomware or or facilitate hacking. Um, it it can be used to disseminate disinformation. There's been a lot of topic talk about the potential downsides of this technology. But what do you? I haven't heard a lot about dependency. What do you think about the potential to become? dependent on this in the same way we are with maybe search before it? Yeah, I, I think it's possible that we'll write, we'll sort of stand on the shoulders of things like GPT as we do things like copywriting. I've seen a lot of people and I've played with this myself talking about how as a writer, you're, you're not going to take what GPT-4 writes but you're going to ask it to give you a little essay that might be a good starting point for you to think about things. I, I myself was doing this looking at, uh, I was asking GPT-4 a couple of days ago, some questions about basic income and about actually how you explain things like wealth inequality um, as it happens in capitalist systems. And it was really doing a great job kind of blocking out some ideas for me. So I think you're right. We may become dependent on these systems. That said, like the internet, I think that things like, you know, AI tools that help you write will probably become very broadly disseminated. You know, I calculated and tweeted about this a couple of days ago that um, at the current prices that open AI, open AI charges for GPT, Four, we could probably put um, terminals, many, many, you know, public terminals in every public library in the United States and allow people to freely come in and use those terminals, you know, at no cost to talk to GPT-4. And if a philanthropist, you know, a new Carnegie, if you will, was to uh, pay for that, it would be something like $40 million a year for the whole country, even at the prices that uh, you know, uh, GPT-4 currently costs, which are doubtless high relative to what they're going to be in a couple of years. I, I kind of want to um, explore that idea. Uh, if I understand you correctly, that the, the costs then scale and the potential for this technology to augment our or humans' current capability is significant. And so what you're saying is that if somebody were to step in and fund access or public app access, open access to uh, uh, GPT-4 and similar technologies, there would be a, a fundamental good to society. Is that what you're saying? Well, let me back up and say it even more emphatically um, and with, with what the risk is. Um, we're at a point, for example, in the United States where the level of wealth inequality that is currently present in our country is probably a fatal situation unless we fix it very quickly. Um, it's, it's become dramatically worse than it was 20 years ago, for example. And it is probably going to drive us into a kind of a broken state that we're not going to be able to get out of until we can address it. And so um, I think that uh, anything that we do that increases inequality you know, increases the divide between the haves and the have nots would be fatal for us as a society, particularly in the United States, but, but globally as well. And so what that means is we must, and as I just said, relative to the prices, there is no excuse for providing these now released AI technologies freely to every living human in the same way, at least it, we need to do it at least as well as we did with access to the early internet. But I think we probably need to do it even better. You know, we need to make things like AI sort of free like air for people. And I think that we've got to get to that um, quickly and that that is at least one correct response. You know, I'm not addressing all the dangers, but that's one correct response to uh, what we've got here with AI. Is there a, a, a potential danger of exposing this type of technology, this powerful technology to people at scale? Let's let's think social networks, mobile phones, and, and uh, technology that came, that preceded this. Um, I, I mean, is that potentially dangerous as well? 
I think it's important to note that we're entering now into a time that is very rocky and dangerous for us, but it is a understandably temporary time where the AIs are powerful enough for us to use them potentially as kind of weapons against each other, but not yet powerful enough to help us not do that. You know, like I think we're in a situation where the current state of something like GPT-4 unfortunately is good enough to empower a person to cause harm to other people pretty easily but we don't have enough kind of wisdom in this evolutionary moment we're, we're in to better understand how to keep ourselves from doing that and so i think there's this uniquely human moment actually where and and frankly it's in our nature where we need to come together optimistically as a species and recognize that we're sort of now arming ourselves with almost, you know, nuclear technology for each of us. And what that means is that we have to find peace and uh, decide not to harm each other. And, and there is, you know, good evidence that in historic experiences, we've chosen to do that. So we can do it now, but I think it's, we're, we have a bad time coming in the next, say, I don't know, you know, call it 10 years where we don't yet have machines that are thousands of times smarter than us that could help us not hurt each other, but we do have machines powerful enough to help us to hurt each other. Um, you know, sticking to that theme of evolution uh, and, you know, we just looked at, at the past, how does that inform what, what's coming in the next, say, 18, 36 months and how can we prepare ourselves for this rapid change that, at least in your estimation, could be fairly transformative? Well, first of all, let me just say that we don't know what's coming. One of the things that's so difficult about this moment, especially for me, by the way, as a futurist, I mean, I think a lot of my life has been, I mean, I, I first and foremost, I'd say I'm an inventor, but a lot of my inventing work has been, has been based on thinking and making assumptions about what was happening in the world, you know, what, what was happening in the near term, say, because of browsers being available or something. Um, and I would say that we have shockingly little ability to predict what happens next because of just the sheer complexity of what we're looking at with something like generative AI. And so the first thing is to respect that we don't know and to kind of make adjustments as best we can for a very uncertain near future. Um, that being said, I think that we will continue to see escalation in the power of these uh, large language models, this kind of alien intelligence that we've discovered a bit ahead of time is, is the way I like to talk about it. I was recently talking with Stephen Wolfram, who's a friend about this, and he was saying the same thing that that we seem to have kind of discovered an alien intelligence, which is really interesting. It's not a, it's not yet a human style of intelligence. It's a different kind of intelligence, but I think we are going to see rapid escalation in the ability of things like GPT to find patterns, for example, between disparate things that we, for example, as authors say could never have, you know, jumped to. And I think that's going to continue to kind of rock our collective worlds um, as we see these insights. We're definitely going to see superhuman performance in almost every category. I think John Carmack said it very well. He said, everything that has an objective function, meaning some sort of quantitative test that can be done to answer how good it's being done by the computers, everything that has a quantitative test like that is now superhuman. Meaning that there's nothing our brains can do for a specific targeted task that the AIs cannot now do better, simply because they're larger now than our brains in almost every way that matters. That makes me, again, think about uh, this term of dependence. Uh, you know, in many ways, I've I've outsourced uh, my reminders and to do lists to Siri and. Uh, Google remembers and performs functions for me in ways that I may be used to with my own capabilities. Um, so I, all of this sounds pr 
pretty astounding, but what are the limitations? Like what, what about, you know, the skeptic in me is like, well, it's still narrow AI. Like it's really just a really good natural language processing plus uh, access to, to capabilities that are impressive, but not like human intelligence of AI. You know, what, what are the limitations here? Yeah, the limitations are very real as well, especially right now. The the technical limitation, by the way, is created, um, I think a a good way of describing it, is that the machines cannot read and write their memory as fast as a human mind can. Meaning that, for example, they can't listen to us while we're talking to them, not in a way that we can. And the reason for that is simply that they actually can't write to their memory, if you will, um, as quickly as they can do computations. So what that means is that we have these kind of zombie AIs right now that we're going to have for a few years that can answer questions. The other way to your point to describe the limitation, I think, is to recognize that these machines right now are completing sentences for us or they're completing paragraphs and they're completing them in the way that we most likely would, not in new ways. So if you ask if you ask GPT-4, well, you can ask it to do some creative things that are pretty cool. It'll, it'll do some neat things. Like we were asking it questions like, you know, how would I design shoes that make humans run faster? And it actually came up with some crazy, interesting, creative ideas. But for the most part, the intelligence that we've got right now with these AIs is limited to um, saying the very best and most accurate version of what any of us might say in answer to a question. So they can kind of instantly uh, tell you what the most perfectly average, brilliant, you know, kind of perfectly well-informed person would say to something, but they can't yet reason and uh, move forward in the way that we can. So it's this kind of encyclopedia, if you will, or super search engine that completes sentences, but it's not thinking about how to overthrow us or something, Not, not just yet. Um, well, I, I think that's reassuring in some ways, but let's maybe end with the end game. Uh, a lot of people talk about, uh, developing super intelligence, like you mentioned, uh, maybe a, a capabilities far beyond this, these generative AI systems. Uh, and there are cohorts of people who just look at, you know, the machine learning capabilities and the business applications. Uh, but what about the kitchen table that if, if I don't care about AI, I don't care about technology, why should I be paying attention to these rapid transformations in generative AI? For the normal person, how is this going to affect my life? Well, I think maybe one answer there and something I've thought about a lot has been maybe it won't affect our lives so much as we might have thought. And and what I mean by that is not that the AIs aren't going to be able to do all these amazing things, but that we may not care as human beings. And that may actually be okay. Um, We may find ourselves kind of living next to these new creatures, if you will, whatever they become that can do things like answer questions for us quickly, more quickly than we ever could, or write code for us. But we may not kind of merge our community and society with them in quite the way that I think some techno-utopian thinkers would would have you believe. In short, I think that we are living the best possible human lives we can right now. And I wonder whether generative AI will really have much of an effect on that. Like, for example, when you look at beautiful works of art from things like Midjourney, which which mark which make no mistake, are beautiful beyond compare. You know, they they are uh, artistic forms. And this is what I was most excited about with Midjourney that demonstrate an artistic capacity beyond human ability. But does that make us want to hang them at the Louvre and go walk by those paintings? I think the answer curiously is no, even though they're better paintings than we could paint. They're not important to us in a way that matters um, deeply, you know, to our human existence. And so I think and I think a source of hope here is to regard AI as a kind of a new uh, type of experience or organism that can be viewed quite separately from our human existence. And uh, I think there's a there's a greatness in approaching it that way and a really positive element of it. 
I'm Dan Patterson, and for more interviews like this one, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And for the latest on emerging technology, visit ZDNet.com.